Hello, I'm Michael Redmond, professional Nindan Go player. In this video, I'm going to be looking at a game between Hoimbo Dosaku and Yasuichi Tetsu. Hoimbo Dosaku was an outstanding player in the 17th century. He dominated uh, Go at that time. Yasuichi Tetsu was the leader of the Yasui school. He was the third leader of the Yasui school, I believe. And he was um, one of the main rivals of Dosaku. So outside of the Hoimbo school, I'd say he was the, maybe the strongest rival. Their careers were parallel in a way. They are about the, they were about the same age in their mid twenties at the time of this game in the 16, uh, in the year 1669. And several years after this game, uh, Dosaku became Meijin, which is equivalent to Nindan in their ranking system. And at the same time, Chitetsu promoted to seven Dan. And that was his uh, highest rank. There are about 50 game records uh, between, of games between Dosaku and Chitetsu, and this is one of the most exciting games they played, I, I believe. Okay, I actually made a video of this game several years ago. That was a video without commentary. It was a, a video showing me playing the game out on a real board, and so I'll, I'll find that and put a uh, link in the description, just in case you want to see that. I think in that game, the orientation was different, so Black's first move is in the lower left corner. But otherwise, it's exactly the same game. Here we see Black's idea in the no komi games, where there's no komi, Black has an advantage. And the idea of keeping his local advantages with these pincers is very true to the style of that day. So Black's trying to keep the local advantage, and thus, by controlling these local areas, he's trying to keep the game relatively simple. We also see Dosaku's like of playing uh, uh, five three points. He's taken all of the five three points on the board, you might say, or at least one in each corner. And he likes to con um, control sides. So he um, plays a game very much on the fifth line, while most of his opponents at the time were playing their opening moves on the third line. And he liked to control sides. He liked to make moyos. So, um, and that did change the Go theory. Uh, so very much like AIs in modern uh, modern Go. Black played what might look like an unusual Kakari. Um, this actually was a popular Joseki at the time. So Black played here in the extension. When Black has this two space extension, that group is uh, strong enough that Black is not worried about an invasion at K17. That said, I would probably play one of my stones on the fourth line here. So I would play a peep and play on the fourth line. So that's how I would handle this side. In modern Go, it's, the general idea is that we want to have a combination of stones on the third and fourth lines to control a side. And that's supposed to give us some um, potential towards the center. So it's a very subtle difference. So he played low. Another thing to consider is the um, Kokari here. This was actually played a lot at the time. And there are a lot of examples of Dosaku pressing here to force Black down to a low shape. So clearly Chitetsu knew this. And maybe he wanted to avoid this pattern, which is, um, I made this diagram up, but it's very similar to similar things that Dosaku liked to do in his games. So there were examples of this. In this case, Black is, has a strong position in the top left and also a fairly strong position in the top right. And Dosaku's idea here with white is that these two uh, strong positions on the single side are combined to be a slight over-concentration of power for black. So blacks maybe played too many stones on the top side. This is actually debatable, but part of white's idea is that there's some Aji in the top right corner. So for instance, if white slides here, it's quite likely that white will be able to, to live. So for instance, in a variation like this, White does have room to make two eyes. To put it simply, there's some Aji there. Okay, so we have uh, what might look like similar positions on the top and bottom side. The big difference between these two positions is that uh, this black group and this black group, the one on the top side has a supporting extension at E17, whereas the two stones on the bottom side do not have that extra strength. So the bottom side is relatively weak for black. 
And uh, that actually explains the way Black is playing in the corners where he's kicking here in the top right, which is uh, the more active, the more dangerous move. And he feels he can do that because he has a strong position on the left part of the top side. Whereas he's playing the more pacific move on the bottom side uh, when he has a relatively weak position. And this is going to affect the way they continue also because white will move out here and he's eyeing that invasion at K3. Whereas he would not move out on the top side and because black's strong already there. And jumping here is an important move also. There might be a tendency to think black wants to play a Hane here, but black would have to be returned to the left side. So he would have to add another stone. And uh, relative to the game, this is reinforcing white's position. So white's getting strong and K3 is becoming a fairly strong threat. So um, for instance, if black plays in the corner, white can invade here. And this turns into a fight which is relatively dangerous for black because white's more or less out in the center on the left there and can attack black first. So he jumps. In a way, you might say he's leaning on the stone on the left side first. And if white still wants to start a fight here, so that would be something like this. In this case, there's a bit more room for that stone in h3 to counterattack with something like this. And a fight like this. In this case, white would be chased around much more and would be sacrificing more on the left side in this fight um, running out into the center. So it would be relatively safe for black and relatively dangerous for white when compared to the game. So in the game, white doesn't actually go for an invasion but um, answers locally. So he's keeping a balance between the left side. And it's going to turn out that white actually has a great interest in the left side as the game continues. So now black can add an extra stone and white's group there is relatively weak compared to black's relatively strong group on the, on the right part of the lower side. So white jumps and black played here. So this is a point where uh, black could have played, for instance, uh, something like this and continued to attack actively. I think partly it's the fact that there's no Komi in this game. And the idea with these games was that black wanted to keep things um, relatively simple. There's also the fact of uh, Chitetsu's style himself. He's a very strong fighter and he actually liked to fight inside his opponent's areas. So he would take territory first and then he would um, invade. So he's actually going to follow that idea with this game. And it works with Homo Dozaku to a certain extent because Hoimbo Dozaku likes to expand these areas, which we see with this move on the fifth line. So he's already starting to expand a fairly large Moyo. And it's exciting because he continues to do so. He continues to play these capping moves. Black's move at F3 was probably the first move that Katago seriously seemed to dislike. It would have been better if Black had played here. Uh, just taking a big opening point. This is a point that Black will want to take eventually. And more actively attack the white group. So it's the same idea that um, at the time people didn't do this so much with black because black had an advantage. And the idea was that if black could win by two or three points, that was a decent win. Okay, in the game, black uh, takes territory. Okay, white uh, plays another move on the fifth line. White is making a threat to um, invade, for instance, at K17 next. So black um, kicks once to deal with that. For the time being, that top side is, it's fairly safe. And now he invades here. In this position, just because of the fact that white has such a wide open area that seems to be controlled by white, this makes it very difficult for, for black to find a good move. It's a very uh, challenging position, I believe. And that's a characteristic of Dosaku's games. So um, while he's not always correct according to the AI, which is true of just about any player, um, he does make these positions that are challenging to his opponent. 
Okay, so he was threatening H15 as well as the idea of uh, E15. So there's a combination of two threats there, and white dealt with that by playing the kick. And black invaded. So when black invades, uh, he's making this white group on the 8 line uh, relatively weak. So it's weaker than it used to be. It's the weakest group um, that white has. Um, so this is a group that white cannot uh, um, afford to sacrifice. It's actually part of the attack against black. But by creating a weakness in the opponent's moyo, a weak part of the moyo, it's going to give black some momentum to, to save his group. So that's why he's diving in so deeply on the third line, uh, because he wants to cut off these two white stones. He also has the idea of expanding his space by playing something like this on the third line to make a little base there. Okay, so white jumped out. When white jumped out, this move was a, an important move that um, established some space for, for black, or at least tried to. So black has a forcing move here, which is threatening the wedge at e8. And if he combines that with a move here, so this would be forcing, and he can combine it with a move at c13 to make a little space, uh, which will be good enough to give black uh, eye space. So that's one of the ideas. Of course, also... Um, this move that black played is important in that it's connecting up, um, uh, making a connected shape with the three black stones. So white doesn't really want to let black off the hook here. The natural move would have been to play a knight's move here. And so black would be doing something like this um, and making that space. Okay, in the game white dived in. He's trying to take away that space from black. He does have to defend against the wedge there, and black has a connected shape. So these stones, they're connected up. It's how uh, black's original plan worked. So while this is one of Dosaku's masterpieces, it's also an example of uh, very good play by Chitetsu. For the time being, his plan is to keep reinforcing this group until it's um, healthy, after which black uh, has to deal with the right side also. Okay. So um, white played here. So this is actually a plan to enclose this black group, um, force it to live, and in the process to build on the right side. Black uh, refused to take the sacrifice. So if black had played here, white would have sacrificed the one stone. And we have this huge area on the right side. So this area is dominated for white for the, by white for the time being. So black uh, refused the sacrifice. And in this case, the point is that black has that move at h15, which will cut off the white stones while connecting the black stones. So for instance, if white plays on the outside, black can connect up, and that would be making a threat against those white stones. So that would finish black's connection to the left side, and he would be able to move to the right side. So something like this. In a position like this, when you only have the one weak group and everything else is alive. Uh, usually you can handle this one group. So black does have to live here on the right side, but um, since he doesn't have any other weak groups, maybe he's okay. So white uh, cut the black group off while defending white's group on the top side. Okay, so white got some local profit there in the top left, but um, it's going to be relatively difficult for white to surround the right side. White still has to get some territory on the right side, a fairly sizable territory, uh, to make up for all of the territory that black has in the top right and the lower left. So this is where um, he played here. This is a reasonable move. He's strengthening black's group while looking at the weakness in white's group. So um, for instance, this knight's move is one weakness that white has there locally. When he plays this without fixing the shape on the right, very uh, likely he's thinking of invading deeply on the right side down to the third line. Kato actually suggested maybe he should play here. This would be a simpler way of playing. Um, it would simplify the game, reducing instead of actually invading the, the right side. And this would have been good enough to uh, keep black in the lead. In the game, he played solidly. He's still ahead at this point. And again, he's dealing with the group in the center first, reinforcing it, 
and now he's moving to the right side. Um, I think the idea was that if white played here, black could, these two stones towards the center would be helping black uh, make a stronger shape. So since he's reinforced the center with the potential of pushing through here to capture uh, some white stones, now he's free to, you know, to make a living shape on the right side. So that was the idea, but actually he probably should have invaded directly. So something like this. And um, the center is alive. Uh, black has the uh, potential capture of these white stones. And also it looks like black could probably connect up to the top side, to the upper right. So he's gonna be okay in the center. And all he has to do is live on the right side. So an example of that would be, for instance, if white plays on the outside, uh, in this variation, black has enough room. So uh, black would connect up to the corner, or if white plays here, in this case, black has a forcing move here and can, has enough room. Uh, actually, black would not do that. Black would add one more stone. Um, if black plays away at this point, it's just barely dead. So and in this variation, black is going to die. It doesn't have enough room. Uh, so black would add another stone to it. Uh, but this would be a success for black. I would say this was a very important move in the game that maybe Chichetsu overlooked it, um, and it made it relatively difficult for black to accomplish anything on the right side, and the result was that the game became very close. So this was his last opportunity to divide, dive in here. He was trying to make it more efficient, so that, that would be this kind of variation, um, to make it a more efficient invasion, and he white uh, sort of dodged the attack, and now the right side is fairly big. Okay, this was meant to be a forcing move, threatening to pull out at k6, which would isolate white's group on the left. White managed to parry it with this move, after which black cannot uh, save that black stone uh, directly. So if uh, black, if black pushes through here then there are two cutting points. So for instance, like this, and black would not be making, accomplishing very much. So that's how the uh, kick at J4 was working. It was creating the second cutting point there. And black now has given up on the idea of invading the right side, he's reducing. It's not as if he's lost yet. The game is still uh, very close. And black played here. So this is a Tesuji uh, that involves the Aji on the left. Um, black would like to be able to, sa to save this stone. So he's going to uh, connect that idea with the idea of breaking into the right side. So that's how it works. So now black has saved that one stone. And the question is, how does white live on the left? White does have to add a, add a stone to it to be alive. So he played here. So first of all, white has an eye in the center. So uh, this is one eye. And there's no way for black to take away the eye on the left. So for instance, if black plays here and tries to take that eye away, there would be a hole on the third line. So black played here. And so white gets an eye on the left side also. So there's an eye there and an eye in the center. And black played here. So there was a problem with this move which was decisive. So what Black should have done is he should cut here, and this would be threatening to break out in the center. So for instance, if White plays here, Black would be able to play an Atari and break into the center. So this would threaten to push through at M9 and also would be um, looking at the opening in the center. So that would be bad for White. So White would have to play here, and Black would be able to squeeze like this. So the difference between this squeeze and the game is that black has a stone at five. And we get to this point. The big difference is that black has a solid position on the bottom side and is still looking at O6. So in the game, when black played here, black's position there on the bottom side is slightly weaker. And white immediately played a honey here. And we can see white's looking at a squeeze. This was a Tesuji but white had a uh, Tesuji to top it. Okay, so this is the point where black crawled. So actually he could have been more defensive and played here, 
but this was already a lost game. So in this case, white would switch to the top side. Um, the point is that if white can close off the borderline like this with Sente and have Sente to play a big move such as K17, then white has a lead at this point. So black crawled. So this is the point where um, Dosaku shows us a final tesuji. Anyone who wants to figure out this problem on the bottom side of the board, I'm about to give you the next white move, which is the answer to this problem. So I'm about to show it to you. Um, if you want to find it out for yourself, please pause the video. Okay, here we go. So this was the game move at L1. It extends white's liberties by one move. So uh, by extending white's liberties, white is threatening the cut at K3 and black has no good way to fill a liberty. So for instance, if black simply defends here, white can play here. And there's now the black stones on the right. The six stones there are captured. They're short of liberties. And if black plays here, he can no longer play at M1 because he's running out of liberties. So this would capture those black stones. Uh, similarly, black can't play here because of the same um, lack of shortage of liberties. And white captures the, now it's seven black stones. So black had to play here and white cut. So that stone at L1 has extended white's liberties to three liberties and black has only two liberties in the center. So white's won that semi by one move. When we compare this with the other variation where black had backed off and allowed this, they're actually fairly close or um, more or less equal. Um, both of these are winning variations for white. I would say that in the game, Chitetsu, it's not as if he missed that Tesuji. I think he chose to show uh, the variation that's more exciting, um, knowing that he was losing anyway at this point. Uh, just to go back to the decisive point, um, he would have still been in the game if he had played the squeeze uh, with this move. So this, this was his last chance to stay in the game. It would have been very close uh, because white would have had to defend against uh, 006 now. So there would be bad Aji at 06. Quite likely black would be able to get to the top side, which is a very important move on the top side. Okay, in the game, white uh, was trying to squeeze with Sente uh, and the fight here ended with white instead capturing these black zones, which was very big. And then he got to the top side also. So the rest is an end game. Uh, White's already leading by several points. All right, so uh, finally I'll take a look at this move. Um, it doesn't work locally, uh, but it's actually a Tesuji where black is setting up the threat of cutting at R11 and combined with this move. So if white plays here, Black can end up uh, making a double Atari. So this would be a double threat. So white has to back off at this point by playing here. And black got to reduce the white territory with Sente. So uh, he did get, he did lose some points in the exchange here with uh, the two blacks, the black stone here and the white stone here was losing points locally, but he got more back towards the center. And so it was, uh, in the hole, it was worthwhile. Okay, white's looking at a squeeze here. And yes, this was a big move uh, which, which saved a number of white stones. When white fills a liberty here, this is making a threat against black's position in the corner. So if black had played um, anywhere else on the board, then white would be able to play the tardy here and the double honey. So this would be threatening, uh, well, if white, if black plays this way, white would be able to connect up on the side. So that would be a, a big end game sequence. Or if black answers here, white would be able to make a ko in the corner. So this would be a ko. Uh, black would play an Atari, uh, let's see, maybe an Atari here would be answered with the ko. So black had to answer that. He answered with this move. So this is, um, getting rid of that uh, potential by making it possible for black to cut on this side and now white won't be able to connect underneath. 
So instead, white's going to try to squeeze on this side. Uh, this is actually where the game record ended. So this is where the game record ended. And black will probably want to finish uh, the sequence on the bottom side. So maybe something like this will was what happened. Black has five liberties and white has four liberties in the corner. So black's winning the race to capture. Uh, black is one move ahead. Black's winning from both sides. So um, whether white tries to attack the black group here or the back black group on the bottom, um, black's going to win by one move in either case. So for instance, this would be a one move win for black. This also is a one move win for black. And so there's no way for white to win. Um, and so it's just a, you might say it's a kind of a squeeze. And then white would uh, move back to some other big point. So for instance, this is a big point. Uh, actually, he might peep first. So this is a big point that saves saves that white stone and stops black from cutting that off. And white eventually won by 10 points. And it does seem to match. I, I'd say white's about 10 points ahead. So that was a game between Hoimbo Dosaku and Yasui Chichetsu. I did make a video of this game played out on a board without commentary. So anyone who wants to see that, I'll, I'll find that video and put a link in the description. I also made a commentary on their first castle game. I made a comment, a live commentary of that. So uh, that's still available as a video. I'll find that one also and put it in the description. Thank you for watching.